What are the occupational health and safety standards for farm workers? The answer coming up in Know Your Rights. Welcome to Know Your Rights, your source for free legal education. Welcome to another edition of Know Your Rights. This is Roberto Cruz, Director of Farm Worker Advocacy and Community Lawyering. Today's topic is health and safety. After this presentation, you will be able to recognize farm workers' general health and safety issues, identify the role of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, distinguish workers' compensation from other kinds of compensation, ascertain the role of the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation, or DBPR, and pinpoint the role of the Florida Department of Health. Let's begin with health and safety. Why? Are health and safety issues important for agricultural workers? The reasons are plenty. Most important is that agricultural workers face one of the most hazardous of all occupations. This is because the risk of death and serious injury is very high. Farm workers suffer from a long-term health consequence of dealing with pesticides and other chemicals in the fields. Physical and mental health consequences also come about because of the exposure to the heat and the weather. It also has consequences on farm workers' families because the chemicals that they are exposed to at work can be brought at home. This also affects other workers even if they are not exposed to chemicals. And ultimately, this is a matter of dignity. If you can't work, then that really affects not only the health and safety of your family, but it also affects the person's um, self-image as a productive member of society. So what is the role of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or also known by its acronym OSHA? Well. With the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, Congress created OSHA. This is an agency that ensures the safety and healthful working conditions for workers by setting and enforcing standards and by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. The typical example of how OSHA would intervene in a farm would be in the case of pesticides. Case in point, an H2A worker contacts you because he's worried. At work, his supervisor told him that he needs to apply some kind of chemical as part of his job. He is given some gloves with holes in them, but nothing else. He is worried because sometimes his hands and eyes burn when he is applying the chemicals. Often, the workers need to eat lunch in the field without the ability to wash their hands before they eat. Often, he does not know where the water jug is. He wants to know if there's anything he can do. In the case of this worker, we may be facing somebody that's exposed to harmful chemicals. And without the necessary protective gear, training, or safeguards for his person, his coworkers, and family. Now, in order to address these issues, OSHA has some requirements that protect workers in the fields. Number one, they have some field sanitation requirements. Number two, they have protections against pesticide exposures through what they call the Workers' Protection Standards or WPS. That includes basic training, information, communication, application and applicator requirements such as um, PPEs and the requirement for emergency protocols when a worker suffers some kind of consequence because of their exposure to the chemicals. Other protections include not only field sanitation requirements or operations in the field, 
but also protections that have to do with the heat, um, the requirement of installing a safety committee, and the extension of those protections in labor camp housing. There are some other special protections that apply to forestry workers and H2A workers. Under OSHA regulation, there is what's called the General Duty Clause. And under that clause, an employer is required to provide a work environment that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So we're not only requiring the employer to comply with hazard specific standards such as uh, exposure to chemicals. We're also talking about other things like the environment. If you are working in the Florida summer heat, that employer needs to make sure that that farm worker is protected from that kind of physical harm that can be caused from the heat and sun exposure. If you believe that there has been a violation of an OSHA regulation, then there are a couple of things that you need to consider. First, you need to look at not only the federal OSHA regulations, but also the state OSHA regulations. States regulate matters of health and safety within the farm worker industry, so you need to determine who has the authority to prosecute that violation. Then you need to determine whether there is in fact a violation. And in order to do that, you need to get as many facts as possible. Then you determine who can file. Whether it's going to be the worker, a family member of the worker, a consumer, or just a member of the public, that person just needs to have sufficient knowledge of some health and safety concern. However, there are priorities set by OSHA. OSHA will first investigate complaints filed by an employee. If, some, if somebody else files a complaint, then they will be given a lawyer priority. Moreover, if it's an anonymous complaint, that will be treated as a non-employee claim with lawyer priority. If you are an employee, a worker, and you have concerns, but don't want to raise those concerns in the, work, in the workplace for fear of retaliation, you have several options. You can file the complaint on your own. You can file it through a non-employee or with an attorney. Either way, you can keep your name confidential when you file a claim. If you do file it anonymously, not confidentially, but anonymously, then again, that complaint will be treated as a non-employee claim with lower priority. Now, how do you file an OSHA complaint? Well, important to know is what to include in the complaint. Number one, you need to describe the hazard. If it's a chemical or is it an issue with the environment, or working conditions, you need to be able to describe it. If it's the weather, you need to say whether it's hot, windy, or other. You need to specify the location of the hazard, the time limits of the hazard, um, and uh, whether a number of workers have been impacted, and what's the preferred language of the workers that have been impacted. OSHA has the ability of sending an investigator that can talk to the impacted workers in their own language. But you first need to, to let the agency know what is the preferred language of the workers affected. If you find that there is no violation of any state or federal OSHA regulation, there are still other causes of actions that you can pursue in order to protect the workers. Other possible causes of action include uh, complaints under the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, or AUPA. There are causes like breach of working agreement, transportation, housing, or misrepresentation. You can also look at the state labor and contractor law. You have tort claims, tort 
complaints have to do with the responsibility of an employer for causing harm to an employee due to their negligence. If they sprayed with uh, pesticides or um, due to their negligence exposed some of the workers to a dangerous condition or environment, then that employer will be liable under the State Tort Act. We can also look at discrimination. Things like the fair housing laws. Fair housing are uh, different kinds of laws and regulations, both in the state and federal level, that prohibit discrimination in housing. In that sense, if you have a worker that lives in employer-provided housing, you can use the Fair Housing Act in order to file a complaint against the employer. Contract claims. If there's a breach of the H-2A agreement between the parties, you can file a complaint for breach of that contract. And you also have related retaliation claims under OSHA. Retaliation claims have to do with any kind of action that was promoted by the employer in order to punish an employee for uh, filing a complaint against the employer for uh, filing a uh, grievance with the agency. The typical case is when you have a farm worker that has been exposed to pesticides, they file a complaint with OSHA and to punish that employee, the employer terminates their employment agreement. So that person is now without a job because they filed a claim with OSHA. In that sense, a retaliation claim can be filed regardless of whether that employee suffered any kind of harm due to that particular action. Now, what is a work-related injury or claim? Well, when we're talking about an injury that was suffered at work, we usually look at the tort claim. We look at negligence. If there was something that the employer could have done in order to prevent this dangerous condition and that employer didn't do it, then that employer is liable to the employee. However, there are other um, statutes that also cover the employee when they suffer some kind of injury at work. And that's what we call workers' compensation statutes. So what is workers' compensation? Workers' compensation or workers' comp is a form of insurance providing wage replacement and medical benefits to employees injured in the course of employment in exchange for mandatory relinquishment of the employee's rights to sue his or her employer for the tort of negligence. So, a worker that is provided the benefit of workers' comp cannot then file a complaint based on tort of negligence. You have to, you have to um, as an employee, take the benefits from wage replacement and, bene and medical benefits instead of filing your own personal injury claim against um, the person that you're working for. Let's explain with an example. Let's say that you have a worker that hurts her hand while working on the farm. She's told uh, by the supervisor to take the rest of the day off. The supervisor did not ask her to fill any kind of paperwork. The worker calls you wondering what to do, and uh, she has worked in that plant for more than 10 years and is also in pain. What can uh, an attorney or an employee do? And how does workers' compensation generally work? It would all depend on your state. If you are a farm worker and you are injured in California, then you are in a full coverage state. 
which means that the state law requires the employer to cover agricultural workers, period. If you are an agricultural worker, you are covered. However, if the injury incurred was in the state of Texas, then you have what's called optional coverage, meaning that the employer is not obligated to provide insurance, but um, there are some employers that may voluntarily have workers' comp insurance. If you're a worker in the state of Florida, then you have what's called limited coverage. That means that certain agricultural employers or agricultural workers are covered. To give you an example, if you are a um, family farmer and you employ your own family members, you will not be required to provide coverage. If you are a very small uh, farm that employs a handful of farm workers, then you will not be required to have that insurance. Aside from that, it will be very difficult for you not to be required to have workers comp. That's in the state of Florida. What are the basic workers comp benefits? For one, you're gonna get medical care. You're gonna get medicine. You're gonna get transportation from your place of residence to the medical care facilities and back. You will get time loss partial pay, which means that any time that you have not been able to work while you are getting treatment uh, will be compensated um, and you will be able to have some kind of income. Now, this is important. If you are given what's called light limited duty, meaning that you cannot perform your job as it's stated in your job description, then you will get uh, paid for the work that you do um, in a light limited duty. The typical example for farm workers is that um, an employee that usually picks fruit, vegetables, or produce will be um, told to instead go ahead and just clean some equipment or um, bathrooms or um, some kind of facilities. So that's, that would be light limited duty. If you are paid full time for that light limited duty, then they won't have to pay you that uh, time loss partial pay. However, if you're in bed and cannot go to work, then they will have to compensate you under certain formulas for the time uh, that you haven't been able to uh, get back to work. This benefit of uh, a um, uh, wages paid to the injured worker is not infinite. It's limited to the time where you are receiving uh, treatment and you get to what's called your maximum medical improvement or MMI. Um, that's when the doctors say that there's nothing else that they can do in order to improve your physical condition. It may be that um, once you reach your MMI, you can get back to work at full time and just to do your uh, typical functions as before the accident happened. If that's the case, then the employer does not have to provide any more medical care uh, and definitely not provide any kind of wages. However, if you get to MMI, the doctor says there's, there's nothing else they can do for you, but you still have some kind of disability that's gonna be permanent, then the employer is required to provide you with medical care for life. Uh, they are not um, obligated to give you any more um, money as part of um, your lost wages, but uh, you will get um, medical care for life to treat that specific work-related injury. Uh, what a lot of people do is that they settle the, um, the permanent disability pay for a lump sum payment, and then they just waive their right to uh, medical care for life. And uh, that's why you uh, may hear of some people saying that they got a windfall from their workers' comp injury, but uh, what they've actually done is settle the, um, um, the matter of the costs that will be incurred to care for the disability for life. There is some basic information that needs to be provided to the injured worker. First, 
that they need to report the injury or sickness to the employer. In that sense, the employee has to have proof as to when and what was reported. They need to follow state procedures regarding how to report that injury or sickness and abide by the specific state um, timelines for making that report accessible. As we'll see, in Florida, an employee has 30 days from the date of the injury to make that report to the employer. Otherwise, they may lose their right to file a complaint under the workers' comp statutes. Another thing that the employee must do is go to the doctor. They need to tell the doctor what happened at work, and generally, that worker may be able to go to the doctor of, the, of their choosing. And um, if they're not provided with the doctor of the, their choosing, they may have the ability to change the doctor that was assigned by the um, workers' comp insurance company. It's important for that employee to follow the doctor's instructions. Otherwise, the employee will be found non-compliant and will lose their right to the benefits. They need to clearly communicate with the employer on anything that has to do with their treatment. They need to give the worker a list of who can help if there are problems. For instance, if you're not getting your check from workers comp for the uh, lost wages, then you will you need to be provided with the information on who to contact and it's not going to be the HR uh, of the employer, it's going to be the insurance company. But who do they need to call within the insurance company? That kind of information needs to be given to the worker. H2A workers have specific issues because they um, will have to go back to their country of origin. And as such, um, workers' comp insurance companies will not be able to provide medical services in the country of origin. It may not be possible. So in that sense, uh, H2A issues may arise that are not typical to the um, workers' comp claims that are filed by um, U.S. workers. The uh, workers' comp injury may also involve an OSHA complaint. If the reason has to do with um, the way that a, an employer is managing COVID or the way that a pesticide is being used or the lack of measures taken by an employer to avoid the damages of climate on the workers, then you may file an OSHA complaint in addition to a workers' comp claim. It's important for workers in Florida to know that there are statute of limitations on their claims. Now, if you are an employee who suffered an incident related to your work duties, then you should report the work-related accident as soon as possible, but not later than 30 days from the date the accident occurs, or within 30 days of the date the doctor says the worker is suffering from a work-related injury. Failure to report an injury or illness within 30 days may result in a claim being denied. Now, let's explain that for a second. Now, what that means is that if you, for instance, suffer an injury at work, and you know that that injury is related to your job duties, then those 30 days are going to start from the date that you knew. Okay? So if you're in the fields and you're picking your produce, you suffer an accident, an accident and break a leg, then you know from that instant that that leg was broken because you were performing your job duties. So that from that day on, you need to count 30 days in order to know that you have a duty to report. However, if you just start feeling sick and you don't know why, you go to the doctor and the doctor says that your uh, symptoms are related to a work-related um, situation, then that's when you knew that um, your injury was caused because of your job duties. That typically happens when you're exposed to some kind of pesticide or some um, environmental hazard like the heat. So we're going to look at the date that you either knew or you should have known that you suffered 
a work-related injury. It's called actual and constructive knowledge. Actual when you knew that you had an injury at work and you had 30 days to report it. And constructive knowledge, that's when you should have known because the doctor told you that you had a work-related injury and that you have 30 days to report it. Now let's say that you report your injury and you're provided with medical care and with some amount of money to cover your um, lost wages. But you don't get the care that you need or the money that you are owed. Well, in that sense, you have what's called a workers' compensation claim. And you can file a petition for benefits with an agency called the uh, Judge of Compensation Claims or JCC. So you file a complaint with the JCC alleging that um, you're not getting the medical care that you need, that you're not being paid your lost wages, and by the way, that uh, you did report within those 30 days, but the employer hasn't provided either that medical care or lost wages. You have two years from the date of the injury to file that worker's comp claim. And after the initial two years, you have um, one year from the last payment of compensation or within one year of the last provision of authorized medical treatment or care to uh, file a petition for benefits. That happens when you have some kind of um, injury that requires care for years and you haven't reached the maximum medical improvement or MMI and all of a sudden the insurance company drops your benefits or the employer stop uh, from providing you the um, medical care or lost wages that you deserve. In that case, then uh, you have one year from that last date, that last payment or last treatment to file that petition for benefits. So be mindful of the statutes of limitations. Now, all the possible legal claims for injured workers will depend on state law and the factual situation. If um, the, the workers' comp law um, is uh, not enough to provide um, sufficient compensation, we need to look at the totality of the circumstances to see whether you also have a tort claim. Remember, uh, that's uh, damages that are awarded based on uh, somebody's negligence. To give you an example, let's say that you are um, driving a vehicle as part of your job and then a private person crashes that vehicle while you're working. Well, you have a workers' comp claim based on the fact that you were working, but you may also have a tort claim, not against your employer, but against that um, uh, private uh, citizen that also bumped into you and caused you damages. So you have to look at the specific circumstances of a case to determine whether there's more um, than a workers' comp um, claim in your hands um, and whether there are other kinds of remedies at law that you can go after to make you whole. There's also the labor contractor laws, as we discussed earlier, ALPA. Um, there's also retaliation for using the workers' comp system. If you're fired because you filed a workers' comp claim, um, regardless of, on, on whether your, your workers' comp claim is accepted or not, that retaliation is subject to compensation. Also, retaliation for reporting health and safety matters. Now, that's, that specific form of retaliation will be covered by um, the particular state or federal agency where you reported your um, complaint. You may also have the right for sick leave, Family Medical Leave Act relief, state family leave may be applicable. If you are an injured worker and you suffered a permanent disability but you want to get back to work, 
you could apply for a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Let's say that you're a farm worker and you lost your arm because of an, in, uh, an incident. And you say, well, uh, I can still be a productive member of the team and I want to be considered for farm work, regardless of whether the fact that I lost the arm. Well, you can ask for a reasonable accommodation and just you just need to prove to your employer that you are still able to uh, work with some uh, kind of uh, modifications that are uh, reasonable for your employer to provide. If you're an advocate for workers' rights, you may have to address issues that involve farm labor camps. That's employer-provided housing. And there are ways in which an advocate can approach workers in labor camp settings. And uh, there are situations where you need to determine whether to raise a labor camp issue with the workers. If you are an advocate working to make systemic changes, this is uh, the time to act. During COVID, we are looking at a lot of the practices in um, employer-provided housing. We've heard the tales of um, employees that need to share their trailers with uh, four other uh, farm workers and one of them has COVID. If that's the case, then you know that you have an OSHA violation in your uh, labor camp and that something needs to be done about it. The way to do this is by participating in committees, uh, filing comments with federal and state level agencies that deal uh, with labor camps, and uh, just to share worker stories and photos. You can do so through uh, social media. If you have uh, materials to share, just contact us and we'll make sure that um, we promote your advocacy efforts through Facebook, Instagram, um, and other media. You can also file a complaint against State Program and Administration or CASPA. That's uh, when your state plan falls below federal standards. We do have some state agencies that look into uh, labor camps, uh, but if those agencies don't have a plan that safeguards the uh, physical and mental integrity of the workers, then we need to do something about it. The other thing that you do is job order advocacy for H-2A workers. In previous presentations, we have looked at those job orders for those temporary foreign workers, and they do have rights. It's just a matter of making sure that the workers know their rights and know how to enforce them. You can look at informal advocacy with state and other federal agencies. OSHA has Spanish-speaking investigators. They conduct investigations and they set priorities. If you wanna be part of the process, you can distribute your materials through them you can alert them of things that are happening in the, in the community so they can set their own priorities. If there are issues regarding workers' compensation, you can address those issues through the state ombudsman. That's their job, to look at systemic issues uh, within uh, the workers' compensation system. There are things like taking off social security numbers from forms. Uh, that is an issue in workers' comp because of the matters relating to uh, the use of undocumented workforce. Well, uh, if you're in Florida, the fact that you are undocumented does not prevent you from obtaining workers' comp. Let me say that again. In Florida, the fact that you are an undocumented worker will not prevent you from getting benefits through workers' compensation. So do not be dissuaded from um, getting access to those benefits because of your uh, residency restrictions. Now, identifying and work uh, with other partners is very important. You can't do this yourself. Uh, advocacy agencies need to partner with task force, uh, with other advocates. They need to be involved in organizations that do migrant education. You go to uh, migrant head starts. That's where the families gather. And uh, you look at their staff. Sometimes the uh, supervisors are farm workers themselves. 
uh, from the community and may want to uh, give you access to um, their workforce. Also, medical legal partnerships. That's when the doctors talk to lawyers and find ways to make sure that their patients, which are our clients, can get a holistic service. If somebody needs medical attention and they can't pay for it, the attorneys may have ways of getting them access to healthcare through government programs, through uh, making sure that they get uh, their benefits from workers' compensation if it's a work-related injury. If it's an issue regarding somebody's negligence, that attorney can get uh, some kind of relief uh, from a personal injury complaint. I mean, it's a, ma it's a way of making sure that we take care of our people. Now, that's important when we're talking about pesticides because a workers' compensation claim based on a pesticide case is not easy to prove. Uh, it takes the partnership between the medical establishment and the legal services to establish that link and get that worker the care that he, she, or they need. Now that takes us to what the role of the Department of Business and Professional Regulation has within the farm worker industry. Now what does the DBPR regulate? Well, they regulate farm labor contractor registration, which means that any uh, corporation that hires uh, farm workers needs to be registered within the state. That's the way that they keep track of uh, the way that uh, farm workers are hired because this is a regulated industry. Second thing that they do is that they regulate uh, some establishments where farm workers may stay through their division of hotels and restaurants. That division has jurisdiction over hotels, motels, resorts, condominiums, as defined by Chapter 509 of the Florida Statutes. And that includes uh, furnished housing for transient occupancy, meaning uh, seasonal and um, migrant work. The Florida Department of Health also has a role within the farm worker industry. Now, the Department of Health has jurisdiction over residential migrant housing, public lodging establishment, and migrant labor camps. So what's the difference between what the DBPR regulates and what the Department of Health regulates? Well, the DBPR regulates hotels, motels, and those kinds of establishments. The Department of Health is more focused on establishments that particularly serve farm workers, like residential migrant housing. We're talking about those trailers that house um, migrant workers or migrant labor camps. We're not necessarily talking about um, in, uh, housing facilities that are outside of the actual farm. These camps are integrated within the job site. And then public lodging establishments, where we're looking at some of, of the establishments that are not defined as hotels or uh, motels that are regulated by the DBPR, but other kinds of establishments available for lodging to the public. So if it's not covered by the DBPR, that establishment will definitely be covered by the Department of Health. So how do we know whether the Department of Health regulates a specific establishment? Well, we look at the people that are being housed in the establishment. And the people that are housed are migrant farm workers. So that's what we're looking for migrant farm workers, not seasonal farm workers. Now the seasonal farm worker is the one that lives or resides um, close to the farm where they work. So if you're a Florida resident and you live close to where you work, then you're a seasonal farm worker. But if you are a migrant farm worker, then that's a person who is 
or has been employed in hand labor operations in planting, cultivating, or har harvesting agricultural crops within the last 12 months and who has changed residence for purposes of employment in agriculture within the last 12 months. Okay, so that's who we're looking at. That's the migrant farm worker, not the person that lives close, but the person that just travels all the time for work and doesn't live close. Now let's look at the specific types of housing that is regulated, beginning with residential migrant housing. That's a building structure, barrack, dormitory, and the land appertaining thereto that is rented or reserved for occupancy by five or more migrant farm workers. Okay? We're looking at that trailer. The house is five people. Except when housing is furnished as an incident of employment, not part of your contract, when a single family residence or mobile home dwelling unit that is not under the same ownership, management, or control as all the farm worker housing to which it is adjacent or contiguous. So let's say that that residence is housing other farm workers, but that don't they are not necessarily employed by the same um, employer. Well, then that's not residential migrant housing. That's just housing. Number three, a hotel, motel, or resort condominium defined by Chapter 503 of the Florida Statutes. Why? Because that's regulated by the DVPR. And number four, any housing owned or operated by a public housing authority, except for housing which is specifically provided for persons whose principal income is derived from agriculture. So let's say that you have a public housing authority from a specific county, call your county uh, public housing authority that has some housing for low income residents. Well, that wouldn't be residential migrant housing, except if the people whose principal income is derived from agriculture. Let's say that that funding comes from not the Housing and Urban Development Agency, but from the Department of Agriculture. There is some public housing that is funded by the Department of Agriculture. And let's say that that public housing facility is funded by the Department of Agriculture to house people that work in agriculture. Well, then in that sense, that would be residential migrant housing. Public lodging establishment, that's another fo form of housing. And that's any unit, group of units, dwelling, building, or group of buildings within a single complex of buildings which is rented to guests more than three times per calendar year for a period less than 30 days or one calendar month, whichever is less, or which is advertised or held out to the public as a place regularly rented out to guests. So, if it's not a hotel or a motel or any other kind of facility regulated by the Department of Health, but it's held out as a place where people can rent out to guests for 30 days or one calendar month, more than three times per calendar year, then you could look at that facility as a public lodging establishment. Think of Airbnb. Would that be a public lodging establishment? Well, Airbnbs are not regulated as hotels or motels, but they are available to guests. Now, license classification of public lodging establishments and the definitions, therefore, are set by 509.242 Florida Statutes. Remember, that term does not include condominium common elements as defined by 718.103 Florida statutes. So if you're renting an, uh, your apartment from Airbnb to farm workers, that's okay. But if you're renting out the cabanas in your condominium, which is a common element, not the actual apartment itself, not the dwelling unit, but just a, a common element to the condominium, 
then that is not a public lodging establishment. And what type of housings are excluded from the definition of public lodging establishment? We already know that hotels are out, motels are out, and condos are out. What about a dorm? Well, a dorm from a public or private school, college, or university for the use of students, faculty, or visitors is excluded from uh, the definition of public lodging establishment. So are hospital, nursing homes, sanitariums, assisted living facilities, or other similar places. Also excluded, any place renting four rental units or less. Unless the rental units are advertised or held out to the public to be places that are regularly rented to transients. Also excluded, any unit or group of units in a condo, cooperative, or timeshare plan and any individually or collectively owned one, two, or three, or four family dwelling houses or dwelling units that are rented for periods of at least 30 days or one calendar month, whichever is less, that is not advertised or held out to the public as a place regularly rented for periods of less than one calendar month, provided that no more than four rental units within a single complex or buildings are available for rent. So those are excluded from the definition of public lodging establishment. Let's define migrant labor camps. Migrant labor camps are one or more buildings, structures, barracks, or dormitories, and the land appertaining thereto constructed, established, operated, or furnished as an incident of employment, as living quarters for seasonal or migrant farm workers, whether or not rent is paid or reserved in connection with the use or occupancy of such premises. The term does not include single-family residence that is occupied by a single family. Migrant labor camps and residential migrant housing need a permit prior to opening. The Department of Health provides some guidelines on the basic knowledge of the rules and regulations for applying to set up a migrant labor camp or a residential migrant housing. Florida law and regulations provide sanitation and health standards relating to the construction, operation, and maintenance of migrant labor camps and residential migrant housing. For that reason, the Department of Housing is in a specifically prominent position to inspect, prevent, detect, and enforce human trafficking laws. Now remember, the Migrant Housing Program is one of the few programs that requires inspectors to perform both exterior and interior inspections on housing units. That's why uh, when inspectors are called, they can look in um, each housing facility and determine whether they believe there's sufficient cause to establish a case for human trafficking. These local health departments inspectors conduct at least two inspections each quarter. And they usually um, look at these facilities while they are occupied. Because of the access the department has to investigate complaints of unpermitted migrant housing establishment, these inspectors are in a very um, critical position to look at human trafficking activity. If you see a housing facility where you believe that there might be some human trafficking involved, you can call the, the Department of Health and then and they can come in and inspect um, and see if uh, they are in fact human trafficking victims, or if they just plain farm workers, whether um, the health and safety standards are being met by that housing provider. It's important to know that the program manager of the migrant housing program also provides local health departments with uh, public health messages and education materials. You can get access to such materials in different languages 
and um, you can distribute them in your local outreach sites. The Department of Health also has the Refugee Health Program. Now that program provides health assessments and immunization services to foreign-born victims of trafficking under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. The Violence and Injury Prevention Section, or VIPS, funds rape crisis centers in Florida to provide the following services 24-7 to victims of sexual violence. Number one, crisis prevention. Two, information and referral. Three, advocacy and accompaniment. Four, counseling. Five, therapy. And six, support groups. If you know someone who is a victim of a sexual assault, you can contact the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence, or FCASV. You can do so by... If you want a referral to any of the agencies that we refer to in this presentation, you can contact Florida Rural Legal Services and we'll be able to help. Otherwise, if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact your managing attorney or externship site supervisor. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you at the next Know Your Rights session.